Hey everybody, welcome to Drive Through Review 140. Uh, today I'm going to talk about The Great Zimbabwe. Uh, it's a game from Splatter Spellen, released at Essen 2012 this year. Uh, it plays two to five players, and sort of the theme of the game is, I'll call it antiquity, I know some people might uh, part with me on that description, but it's basically sort of ancient Zimbabwe, um, and you are basically these different sort of tribe leaders trying to uh, control trade of different resources, and there's some sort of mystical kind of things. With the, there's different cards you can draw, specialist abilities, god abilities, things along that line. Uh, it's pretty much unlike any game I've played. I've never played a splatter game before. This is my first splatter. And I figured I'd uh, do a review of this. It's a little bit hard to find. It's going to be harder to find probably shortly. So I figured let me get a review done of it now. And uh, so if you do have interest in it, then you should pick it up now because it'll probably go way up in value, I would uh, expect. Uh, so let me show you how it works, and I'll come back and tell you what I think. Okay, so I thought I'd give you just a quick component rundown of everything that's going to kind of come in the game here. Now, the main pieces that you're going to look at here are this board here. And you can see this is the start board. This will be in every game. And you've got starting places where you're going to place your monuments to start the game off. And then you're going to randomly configure the board uh, with these different configurations here. You can see you've got some water spaces. You've got spaces for resources here. And depending on the number of players, you'll set out a different uh, number of configurations. I'll set out a four-player configuration for this. And uh, so this is the main area of the board. You're going to be building uh, monuments here and also building craftsmen and also possibly terraforming it, so to speak. So a player may get craftsmen of a sort here and put this on the board. I'll explain how that works. And then you're going to mark that uh, with one of your pieces in a player color. And again, you can take some actions with some special abilities to actually add resources to different spaces on the grid. You could even uh, use the Shaman ability, which I'll cover, and you can turn into water uh, into some spaces or even sort of like add on to water there. So I can show you some of the player pieces here. You basically got two main types here. You've got this little marker here, which you'll put on a craftsman. So if I have a craftsman there, then I'll mark it with me, which means that I own that, and you're going to have to pay me money to use that. And then you've also got these little tokens here, which you'll build, um, like I said, here in a starting spot to start the game. And then you want to try to build this up higher and higher and higher to get points. This is sort of the main way uh, that you'll score victory points. So here we can look at this board here, which has the victory points as well as the player order. Now each player has a starting target of 20 victory points that they need to achieve victory. Uh, everybody's going to start with one victory point, basically for the one uh, monument that you'll have out. And this target, though, can actually change. I'll explain a little bit uh, about that in a, in a minute, but as you sort of gather more special abilities and more craftsmen and things like that, it's actually going to increase the amount of victory points that you need. So you're going to keep track of it here with a cube like so. You, so you have the one there, and then as you get more points, you go up here. But as you get more special abilities, it's going to go up to here. Now, obviously, you can never go above 40, but you're going to make it really hard on yourself if you take too many special abilities. In effect, to become too powerful, it's going to require you to get a lot more victory points. And then there's a player aid track here. And then you can just look here. You can see that as you build the monuments, you're going to get more and more points. So if you have a monument that is basically five discs high, that's going to give you 21 points, which is enough to win the game. But, you know, that's probably not going to happen. Some other features here are these cattle. And see, so you've got silver and uh, gold ones, and these are worth one buck or whatever. And the gold ones are worth three. This is the money in the game. You use that to buy certain things. You've also got these markers here so that when a resource is used for the round, you're going to mark it off so that nobody else can get access to that resource until the next round, which is key. And we've got these little tokens here, which are used to determine player order. I'll talk about that in a second. And then you've got the cards here. The cards are really sort of the heart of the game in some respects. So first off, we've got these technology cards here, and these are going to match the different uh, types of uh, craftsmen that you can get out. So you can see here, you've got the sculptor here. And so when you go to build the sculptor, if you don't have this technology in front of you, then you'll need to get it. And then you'll need to actually purchase this and put this out on the board. So you can see this will cost you four cows to put out on the board. It's also going to increase the amount of victory points that you need by three. So as soon as you take this technology, it's going to increase it by three. But then for each of these types of craftsmen that you build, you're going to score two victory points anyway. So you're going to kind of make that back. And so there's a card, there's a couple of cards for each of these. And these craftsmen have sort of a primary and then a secondary aspect to it. So these are all the primary craftsmen at the top here. 
And you can see the ones for the diamonds here, there's only one type. There is no secondary uh, craftsman in that tree, so to speak. But to get this one out, you'll need to have this one out on the board. Not necessarily by you, but this one will need to be out on the board. And then you'll be able to upgrade to this one. Even if it's not you, you can upgrade it even if somebody else has it. But in a sense, it's almost going to obsolete this first row of technology here. And I'll explain that in a little bit more detail. Finally, we have the specialist cards and the god cards. Now, the specialist cards are going to come out every game. You're going to be able to take these on, on your turn if you wish. You can see it's going to increase your victory point requirement by a certain amount. There's a variety of abilities here. And then you have the god cards here, which are going to be uh, randomly shuffled each game. So you're not going to uh, you know, play with all of these each game, so that'll add a little bit of spice and flavor to the game. Uh, and again, these give you a special ability that you can do and increase the amount of victory points required to win. Actually, I lied a little bit there. I'm only going to set up for a two-player game just in the interest of uh, saving myself some room. So you can see here's a two-player setup with the start tile and then you know the extra tiles there. And you got the three-player, four-player, and five-player setup like so. So the first thing players are going to do is they're going to randomly determine turn order for the first round. But then players are going to place these little monuments here in one of the start player spots here. You can see the little sandals there. Then each player is going to start with three cattle, and then you're going to go into this phase to determine the turn order. This is known as the generosity of kings phase. So what's going to happen is, in turn order, going left to right, so randomly we'll have to determine this to start the game, uh, but so the red player is going to be able to bid. He's got to bid at least one or pass uh, of these cattle. So what he's going to do is he'll maybe bid one cattle, okay? He, that'll keep him so he's going to stay in the bidding. And then the next player is going to come in. He's going to have to bid at least one more. So yellow is going to now bid since he's next in turn order. He's going to bid two. And then black's super crazy. He's going to waste all his cattle. And he's going to bid three. So he's going to bid starting on the next one. And then he's going to loop back up here. Up here. So he's going to bid there, two, three. And now it's green's turn. Well, green's going to pass, so he's going to go last in turn order. So in this case, green will automatically drop to the last part of turn order, and then the next opportunity will come to red to try to bid or stay in. Now everybody at the beginning of the game has used their three cattle, so red's going to drop out. He's going to move to the third spot, and then yellow's going to drop out, and then black. So black will be first, and then everybody's going to take the cattle that was on their card. So that's actually a pretty interesting little mechanic there. So you basically keep bidding, and as you pass, you drop out, and you fill up from right to left. And then however many cattle you have on there, uh, you get the cattle. Now I should say there's a special ability on a god card that will let you place one of uh, this marker here in front of all the other players. So that no matter what, you're always going to get the first cattle. And it, when you loop back around, you're going to get the cattle here. So if you have the god ability here, you're going to be able to generate some cattle basically every round through this bidding phase for turn order. So after you bid for turn order, then you're going to go into the main phase of the game. Uh, again, each player has this little outline here, uh, which shows the technology tree for the different craftsmen, as well as a quick outline of play, which is not too difficult. So the first option on your turn is to take a god card, and you just basically take it and it's yours for the turn. Now you can only take one of these god cards, okay? Once you take a god card, you're locked into that. You're not required to have a god card, but you want to really think about that and, you know, it's, Kind of decide early on what kind of strategy you're going to use with these different god cards. And again, that's going to increase your requirement there. You also have the option, instead of choosing a god card, or if you've already chosen one, you can choose one of the specialists here. Now, to do the specialist, you have to immediately take whatever the action is uh, that the specialist says. So you need to have, and it usually is going to cost some cattle or something like that to use. So when you take that, you've got to be able to actually use it that turn immediately, and then you can use it whenever you want later on... Uh, other turns. And then you basically have three options on your turn. You can erect a new monument, you can place a craftsman, or you can improve an existing monument. So let me talk a little bit about that. So first, very simply, is erecting a new monument. So very simply, what you're going to do is you're going to place one of these monuments out on the board. It's got to be an empty space. It can't have a craftsman on there or be water or have a resource. And you can't be adjacent to any other existing monument. And that includes diagonal or orthogonal. So I can place it there. So I could place it anywhere I want. So I can just play, maybe I place it over here, try to get a little start uh, going, and uh, then you basically take a victory point. And as simple as that sounds, this is probably very much the key aspect of the game. Once you get a good understanding of these god cards and the specialists and sort of the interactions of the craftsmen and how the resources are divvied out, this is going to be a very, very key aspect of the game, and you don't want to um, overlook this at all. 
Now the next thing you can do is place a craftsman. And you can see you've got sort of a technology tree over here, like I said earlier. Basically, you've got these types of craftsmen here. And this guy, he needs this resource. He needs to be within three spaces of this type of resource. And then you've also got uh, secondary craftsmen who need to be within range of this type of guy and also its own resource itself. So you can see uh, this guy here requires a tree. And then this other guy requires the basic craftsman and a tree all by itself. So the rules are slightly different for the basic craftsman as well as the secondary craftsman. So the main rule is that you need to be within three spaces of this resource. So I could build him like here. And so he's within one space of this resource here. But then I could not later, nobody could come along later and build another craftsman that also required that resource like so. So once this guy has sort of a lock on this, he's basically mining this area for uh, this resource to produce goods. Uh, then nobody else can come in and take that. He would have to come over, like, say, over here or something like that. Now, in terms of proximity, one kind of neat aspect of this is that water is basically one space, you, no matter how large it is. So I could actually place this guy here, and I could go one, two through the water. So it's the first space and then the second space through water. So that's a kind of a neat way to sort of jump and, you know, kind of get reach from maybe one of your monuments, which I'll explain why you would do this in a little bit, but basically get to some of the other areas that are further away uh, on the board. Now, if you don't already have the technology card that matches this craftsman, you're going to need to take it, increase your uh, victory point requirement, and then you need to pay and then, uh, you know, to build that. But by paying this amount of cows and building that, you'll get a victory point. So you kind of get some of this back right away. And then once you have this card, then you can build uh, as many of these as you want on later turns. Uh, and there's only th three of each of these. Now you can, if you want, build multiple craftsmen on your turn, uh, but you can never build the primary and then go ahead and build a secondary of the same type uh, on, your, on the same turn. Now if you were to build a secondary craftsman, here's an interesting part here. So what you could do with this is you can actually use hubs. So just for argument's sake, I'm going to build this guy up here like so, and he is going to basically need this resource, because remember they also need a basic resource, and then he also needs to get access to this. But you can actually use hubs to uh, get to that extra primary craftsman. And what hubs are, are these different monuments here. So uh, not only are these going to score you points, but they're also going to act as sort of uh, shipping hubs or however you want to phrase it. So basically I can draw three spaces. i got one, two, three to uh, this hub. And then I can go basically one basically with the, the water. But if the water weren't there, I could go one, two, three to this hub and then one, two, three to that so he has access via this sort of network of hubs uh, to get to that and it could be any color it doesn't matter oh and i should say that you're actually going to mark these to show that you own them and so when people utilize them they've got to pay you and speaking of paying you when you take this technology card you're going to put a price on here so you can choose one two or three cows so when somebody needs to use uh, that resource uh, to upgrade their monument, and I'll explain that in a second, they're going to have to pay you a certain number of cows. So this is really cool because you can maybe, if you want to, uh, take it easy at the beginning of the game and charge, you know, one cow. But I think as players get more experience with the game, they're going to be a little bit more brutal about their, uh, their cost here. But again, you've got to keep it in line because actually what's going to happen is you're also going to need to pay the cost yourself when you use this. Uh, what's actually going to happen, though, is when somebody is paid for the resource, the cows are going to go on the card itself. And then at the end of the round, you're going to pull back any cows uh, that people paid you or that you actually paid yourself. So you've got to have the cows to do it. You'll put it on the card, and at the end of the round, everybody collects their income. So these, these will come right back to you. So this is a really cool aspect of the game. Now, you can actually take the craftsman action and not build any craftsmen. And then if you had a uh, price here, you can actually... Um, increase the price of the cows. So you can just take the craftsman, not build anything, and then increase the price of some of your different uh, craftsmen. So the next thing you can do is improve your monuments. And like I said, this is going to be the main way uh, that you score victory points in addition to, you know, building the craftsman on the board. So let's talk about that. So when you raise monuments, you can raise more than one monument, basically one level each on your turn, but you can never raise, you know, the same monument multiple levels. And the way that you're going to do that is you basically need to uh, have one resource uh, per level. So if you're at level 1 going to level 2, you need one resource to go to level 2. If you're going from 
level two to level three, you need two different resources to go to level three. And then again, if you're at level three going to level four, you need three different resources and so on. So if you're gonna level up this guy here, uh, he's gonna need access to a craftsman that has uh, access to a good. And so let's say he was gonna use this guy here. So you can see he's got one, basically one, two spaces to him. And then this has access to this good that's far away. So he's got access to this craftsman who has access to this good. So I'm gonna utilize that good. I'm gonna mark it with this marker there. And boom, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna put a little monument there and get that amount of victory points. So this is gonna get removed at the end of the turn. If I come along later, and let's say this guy's built here like so, let's pretend I'm dominating the board here and he's also got control of that craftsman. Then I'm gonna need one, which I can get to, and then I can get access to the second one. And so now I can go from level two to level three and score some victory points. Now it's not always going to be that easy. So let's say this guy was way over here like so. And I was at level two and I wanted to basically use this resource, which I can use again. And then I need to get way far away over here. Well, I'm not gonna really be able to access that because I've got one, two, three, and I can't quite get over there. Well, let's say the yellow player, luckily enough, had a monument they had started. Uh, let's see, one, two, three, and I could put him here. Let's just put him there. And then now he has access to uh, this space here. And so I can go one, two, and then I've got to use one hub. So when I use a hub, I have to pay a cattle into the bank. So I pay it right back into the bank, and then I'm going to pay whoever owns the craftsman again to use the resource that the craftsman has access to. So in this case, I'm just paying myself, but I remember all the cattle is going to come off the card, and I'm going to get it right back. Now, the key aspect of this is as these secondary craftsmen come out, they basically are obsoleting these primary craftsmen. So what I was doing here in this example was technically illegal. So let me explain to you the legal way of doing this now that this is built. Now, if this hadn't been built, then I could have done what I did just fine. But once this is built, I basically am forced to access the primary basic good, which ends up being this guy, through this secondary craftsman. They kind of come and they corner the market and this guy becomes obsolete, even though they require this one to be existing. So it's interesting here. So if, let's say I just wanted to build uh, this first level and forget about this purple resource. So now that this guy's built, I have to use him. So I've got access to him. I can go one, two, three, and he's going to use up his main resource because remember he needs the resource all by himself. And then he's got to work back to this guy. So I can go one, two, three, basically using myself as a hub and then back here and then go to this one here like so, because he's three away. So I'd have to pay a, uh, a cattle to the bank to, because I had to use a hub jumping back from this guy to try to get access back to here. So it sounds probably more confusing than it is, but basically just the thing you have to keep in mind is that when the, the secondary craftsman comes out, I've got to use him and then I can use hubs from him to try to jump to get to the primary craftsman. And this becomes especially more difficult as, you know, more of these get built and more of these resources are being used. And, you know, you need to sort of start being able to bounce around hubs. And that's why I've talked about at the beginning, having this locations uh, early in the game is going to be very, very key. That's pretty much the game. I'm pretty sure I flubbed up something there trying to explain that part of it. But uh, basically you, uh, you bid for turn order. Everybody takes an action, maybe activate some of their special abilities. And then you collect any income that may uh, be existing on your cards, and then you kind of see if check for a victory. Now the game's going to end in the round that somebody passes their target victory marker. If more than one person passes it, basically whoever passed it by the most is the winner. So if my target was 20 and I got 23 points, that means that you know I passed it by three. But if you also pass it and your target was 26, you know, from taking extra ability cards and you got 27, you only beat your target by one. So I would actually win. Okay, so let me, I'll, I'll go back to my talking head there and talk a little bit about some of these various god abilities and these specialist abilities. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the overview. And like I said, I was going to talk a little bit more detail about the different special abilities uh, as I came back here. Um, I think I maybe probably turn some people off there with some of the, my descriptions. I've tried to be as clear as I can. Uh, I think this is a, it's a kind of a game where you kind of have to just kind of play it once and get the feel for it and kind of see it sort of organically grow. Uh, some of that location stuff can be uh, sort of tricky, but once you get the hang of it, it's not too bad at all, really. So some of the, uh, the ability cards. Okay, so here is maybe a problem with the game. 
And I'm not sure, I haven't played it enough to know, but we had a discussion with my group um, after a couple of different games. And it basically seems like a couple of the cards could be, uh, the God cards specifically, could be overpowered. Now, that might be because of the random distribution of them. Because you don't use all of the God cards. You shuffle in and then you use only a few each game. Uh, so, the two that come to mind, or three possibly, that come to mind are this one God ability that lets you use the same type of resource instead of uh, different different types of resources to raise your monument. So I don't see personally how that could be um, that overpowered. So I, I'm, there's a disagreement there. Um, but I think that if you zoned it in the right way so that you didn't let the person have access to uh, you know, the same resource over and over, it shouldn't really matter that big a deal. Now the other one that is probably a little bit more problematic is there's a God card that lets you use a resource that's already been used once per turn. So remember, you put the marker on there that uses up the resource for the round. Well, if you've got this one God card, you can come in and just double dip all those resources. And there's really nothing you can do to stop them. I think. Okay. And I'm, this isn't, I'm not trying to say this is gospel at this point. Um, but what's going to be important, especially towards the end of the game, is turn order. Because you really want to get access to those resources, build up your monuments before everybody else, use up all the resources so they can't use them. Um, and then, so that's going to be very, very much key in the, especially the middle to later part of the game. Uh, the other god card I kind of showed you about it is the, that turn order one, where you put that tile in front. So if you've got that god card, people are going to uh, give you cattle every turn. Um, and I really, really enjoy using that card. <laughs> Um, so, but the thing is, is if, if there is a God card that is particularly overpowered, you can just not use it because you don't use every card every game. So you can say, you know what, we don't like this, our group doesn't like this card, throw it out. And I, I'm okay with that because, um, I think I'm okay with that. I just, I haven't played it enough, so it's just, it's sort of a caveat to, um, to take in mind. So I personally don't have, wouldn't have a problem if the one God card turns out to be, eh, slightly overpowered. Or maybe you can errata it so that the victory point requirement is instead of uh, three, it's like six or something. Um, but other than that, I really enjoy this game. I really like the sort of real estate aspect of it, how location is very important, uh, and the basically the management of the different special uh, powers that you can get. Uh, that really, uh, the whole aspect of pushing up your victory point requirement as you take on these different specialists and the different god cards. Um, you can only take on one God card, but, you know, I really like that aspect of it. And the whole, the turn order bidding is really cool. I don't know why I like that so much. Uh, it's one of those things where this game is a little bit tricky to explain, um, you know, verbally. It's, the game, games uh, can sometimes have sort of a other language uh, thing to them. So it's not like I'm telling you a sentence about something. It's like, okay, you, you remember that time you put the red thing there? Yeah, that was neat, <laughs> you know. Um, sometimes it gets like that. In this game, I kind of get that, uh, uh, takes me to that whatever that other language functioning level is. Uh, so, anyway, sorry about that. Um, but uh, this has a lot of those little cool aspects of it. It's very much in your face, and I really like how you can raise the prices of your stuff. Uh, it just has a lot of these real super economic uh, types of things to them. So, like I said earlier, this is my first splatter game, and... Uh, uh, one of the problems with their their games is they can be quite expensive. So if you do uh, get this, I don't know if it's going to be worth the cost to you. So um, that's sort of a that's a that's a iffy subject, right? I mean, you know, if you can afford it, then I would get it. But uh, it's going to be sort of your call in that case. I would say it's a game, a great game, and I recommend it. Uh, and as far as that goes, so it's going to be gone here soon. I would highly recommend if you can try it. I think. Um, it's not going to be for everybody. I have a feeling that some people are not going to like it. I mean, there's people in my group that don't really care for it. But I really enjoy it. I really, really enjoy it. Uh, one of the best games I've played this year, probably. Uh, I need to give it some more plays and some other games some more plays. But I really like these, the flavor of it, the theme of it. And I really like this whole real estate thing. I've never really kind of seen anything... Uh, that really work this way. I mean, you've got like train games and, you know, networks and things like that and track um, that you kind of, you know, you have that sort of board presence. It's not sort of this abstract thing um, like a lot of Euros are. Uh, so I really get into that aspect of it and the whole thing of obsoleting 
the technologies. I'm just kind of babbling at this point, but it's just got a lot of nice, cool little elements in it. So if you get a chance to try it, definitely take a look at it. Thanks.